Okay, let's start from the top. So we started with hearing loss. Let's now start with vision loss. So there's several levels of being blind. So some people are just simply vision impaired and some are considered legally blind. When you're legally blind, technically they can see something, uh, but they cannot see enough to, to function on their own. Okay, so it's might as well be, they might as well be like blind as a fact. Okay. So same thing as hearing impairment. Is this dangerous? Can this cause harm? Yes. Can't imagine living uh, blind. Okay. okay. So let's start with the nursing care with blindness. Usually tells us how to Okay, right under here, they're seeing management. So for the hearing, I mean the vision impaired patient, let's go straight to safety. All right, so this, there should be a chart. Yes, okay, there, here, it, here it is. So chart 58-4 is for how do you care for patients with vision impairment? I won't read it for you. I'd just like to emphasize a few things that most students get wrong on the exam. Uh, here, uh, how you approach the patient. So when you enter the room, okay, you have nine sneakers. So our sneakers don't always squeak, okay? Uh, they're, they're dry, the floor is clean, there's no squeaking involved. So the patient won't know that you're in the room. Okay, they can't see squat, so therefore always announce. Knock your ear and then announce yourself. Hi, Stanley. Hey, your favorite nurse. Hey, I'm here. Okay. All right. So, and then announce, of course, why are you here? Right. And then with the, so here it's appropriate to touch the person's uh, hand. Okay, yeah, but uh, be aware of cultural differences as well. Okay, so you don't have to speak. You know, loudly, okay, they're, they're blind, they're not deaf, okay? Sometimes we forget. And then whenever you're giving them instructions, so let's say, because we promote in independence, right? What did you learn in fundamentals? How do you tell them to be themselves? Okay, we use the clock reference, yeah? So we tell them where to, where to find the food, okay? Uh, so their belongings are <clears throat> nearby, Okay, that they can uh, get them um, and hold them as they ambulate. Then maintain safety. Remember, these patients can see, so make sure the room is free of clutter. Uh, it will be a different scenario when we discharge these patients. Physical therapists will have to evaluate the patient at the home. We look at the patient's living conditions and work work from there. Uh, sometimes it's not a physical therapist, it'll be the RN. Let's say you work in home care, you'll be the one sent to the patient's home. Right? For them, especially if they're new blind and need to get used to their environment. So they need uh, home health care for a few weeks or a few months, okay, until they get acclimated and can cope with the <clears throat> loss of vision. Uh, service animals are beneficial. Okay, these are expensive though, so I won't go into that. <clears throat> That's it for vision loss. Let's go now to uh, eye drops. Just be quickly, all of you should be knowledgeable on how to administer eye drops. Okay, so a few questions. Let's say this, uh, especially when we go to glaucoma, glaucoma patients will have multiple eye drops. <clears throat> so here are a few facts you need to know, which will help you remember the procedure. So a few facts is, where do we put the eye medication? On the eyeball? Okay, there are no blood vessels really to absorb anything from the eyeball. 
yes, we see red blood vessels in the sclera, yeah, you can see it in the whites of your eyes, yeah, the blood vessels, but can the medication really be absorbed there? And no, because there's an invisible lens over your eye. So when you put medications, is the medication really reaching the eyeball? No, because we have a lens there. So all medications really be absorbed in the lower conjunctival sac. Okay. However, this sac can only hold 50 microliters. And the fact is, one eye drop is about 20 to 35 microliters. So when you put one eye drop, can you put a second one? Impossible. So what will happen? So we can, let's say it holds 35. If you put two eye drops one after another, what will happen to the other 15? Oh no, the other 20, because that'll be 70 now, right? So what will happen to the 20 microliters? It'll just come out. Okay? Plus not to mention what will also be stimulated once you put anything into the eye? Tearing, yeah. So that that and the the limited uh, capacity will just waste the medication, right? So therefore, what should we do? One drop at a time, and then wait how long? At least two minutes before putting in another one of the same medication. But if it's a different medication, how long between drops should you wait? Five minutes. Same medication. You can get away with two minutes. So when you're working in a nursing home, how would you do this? The patient has three eye drops to be administered, one in each eye. And remember, in a nursing home, you have 40, up to 40 patients. So how are you going to do this? Are you going to wait? Because how long is that? Let's say three eye drops, one drop in each eye. So how long will that take? At least six minutes, yeah? So are you gonna, do you have six minutes to sit there and wait? No, because you have other patients, yeah? So you have to be creative with how you do your med pass. Okay, maybe administer these eye drops. Then meanwhile, while waiting two minutes, you, you do something else, right? Maybe close that chart, administer medication on the next patient. That should take two minutes, come back to that patient. Yeah. Okay, so be you know be creative, right? Because otherwise, these medications are very important. Okay, you can't go without these, especially with glaucoma patients. So if these patients don't go, they can't get their medication because you've been just dropping them and the patient's not absorbing any because you're because you're putting in multiple drops. So no wonder these patients go blind. Yeah. Because these patients are dependent on you. So what made them go blind? The RNs are not giving the medications. Yes, it's documented that you gave it, but did the patient really receive it? No. So I told you about the barriers already. So we have the lens, the corneal membrane. Then we have blood ocular barriers as well. And then lastly, what will be stimulated again whenever you put anything, an ointment or drop, tearing, blinking, and drainage that will either dilute or wash off your medications. Okay, so another reason why you wait how long? One to two minutes between eye drop administration. All right. Now for the, what if it's an ointment? Because you know on the steps, uh, what do we do again with the, how do you ag exactly administer the medication? Eye drops? What, what should you have ready? Tissue. A tissue, right? Okay, so you ask the patient to look up, then you administer one drop quickly, and then what do we do? Apply pressure where? In the inner canthus. This is also called the punctum. P U N C T U M. Punctum or the inner canthus uh, mean the same thing. All right? So you do that, and what do we not do to the tip of the eye drop bottle? So not contaminate it. Okay? Don't let it touch the eyelash or your hand or even the tissue. What if you contaminate it? Do we throw the whole bottle? 
but you clean it. Wipe it with alcohol, but you clean it. Because once the bottle is contaminated, what's, what's, what are you doing subsequently? So you're putting in contaminated med med contaminated medications now for however long, long that bottle lasts. Okay, so we have several types of medications for the eyes. So most of them are eye drops, but we do have ointments okay, or creams. Now, if it's an ointment or cream, of course, it's not going to drop, correct? So what you do is squeeze the medication in the same spot. However, do we need to put pressure on the inner canthus or the puncta? If it's an ointment? No, because the, the ointment, that will it run like a thin liquid? No, it will just stay there. Okay? You just simply wipe off the excess ointment. So if ever the patient receives an uh, eye anesthetic, so here's a warning. All right. Uh, the glaucoma will be on the next page, but the medications are here. Table 58-3. The ones I highlighted will be on the exam. So first is atropine, next phenylephrine, hydrochloride. Uh, we have more on the next uh, page. Okay, we already mentioned this earlier. Right. Do we need to wash our hands? Okay. Please, right? So I mentioned how long, five minutes, okay, especially if they're different medications. All right, next topic is glaucoma. This is a chronic uh, condition. This can be developed at birth, meaning small children can have glaucoma. So yes, most people with glaucoma are elderly, but it didn't start at old age. We started having it in their younger years, never got diagnosed, so it got worse over time. And then by the time we diagnose them in the later stages of life, it's too late, they're already blind. So the problem here is uh, elevated intraocular pressure. So let's review the um, 1909. Let's go to the physiology, anatomy of the eye. Okay, so here's your, here's your eye. <coughs> When the glaucoma says it's narrow angle, close angle, open angle glaucoma, what is this angle that they're talking about? Okay, these are the drainage pathways of your acute humor. What is acute humor? That is the liquid portion of your eye that makes your eye round, right? So why are our eyes again round? Because of the aqueous humor. Now, this liquid is constantly produced and drained nonstop. Your eye makes it, produces it, and it also uh, constantly drains out of your eye. Now, anytime there's an imbalance, that, so let's say either there's an increase in the, in the production of the aqueous humor or a decrease in the drainage, what will happen to the pressure inside the eyeball? It will increase, okay? So it's one or two uh, of those problems. Sometimes the patient will have both problems, increased production plus decreased drainage of the aqueous humor. So that causes glaucoma because once the pressure here increases, what will happen to the nerves, your retina? the microscopic blood vessels and the nerves that supply the eye. You will damage those nerves and those blood vessels, okay, leading to blindness, all right? 
So therefore, these narrow canals here we see um, will be obstructed by some sort of, uh, in one way or another, that causes increased IOP and therefore you have glaucoma. So the objective of treatment is one of two as well. So you either decrease the production of aqueous humor, you get drugs to do that, or you can increase the drainage of the aqueous humor. Okay, so that you know the cause, and then that will be the target of our treatment. So we will give them medications, we'll give them eye drops that do one or two of those. So that's why these patients will, will take multiple eye drops just to maintain their sight. So we don't give them the eye drops, and these are forever. Okay? They take these drops, there's no cure for glaucoma, so they take these eye drops forever, right? So um, so if they miss these eye drops, what will happen to IOP? Increases, and then damage again to those fragile structures happen, and then they go blind. Okay, there are many types of glaucoma. We will, <clears throat> and here's the uh, eye drop administration. Uh, it, it's here because, again, among all the eye disorders, glaucoma requires the most number of eye drops okay, prescribed. Now, this can be a hassle, right? Uh, who here are used to taking eye drops that they can administer on their own? You do that? Glaucoma? Yeah. Okay. So uh, is it nice to have eye drops? Uh, what do you feel after each drop? Burn. What else? Itching and then it uh, you said burning, itching, uh, it's it's uh, okay, like blurred vision, right? Okay. Does it go away over time? Like the more you use eye drops, that do they eventually go away? Or do you get used to it? Or is it there every time? Do they go away ever? They never go away. Because why are these sensations there? Are they there because, just because? Or are they part of our protective mechanisms? These are protective mechanisms set by whoever our creator is. To, to, to protect the eye so that every time you put something in the eye, whether it's a medication or debris, you know, bird poop gets into your eye, there's a protection, okay? So our eyes react this way whenever you put something in it. So these sensations will never go away. No matter if you've been on these eye drops for 50 years, they will always be there, right? So therefore, when this encourage, so let's say it's a young teenager, that has glaucoma and now has to administer eye drops for the next part, you know, remain remainder of their lives. Do you think you'll have very good compliance? No, because these young people, of course, uh, nobody wants eye drops. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it'll be uncomfortable, and then that's a challenge okay? because now these patients might go blind. Okay, I um, won't read these for you. That's uh, easy to do. I already described the, here's how to administer the eye ointment. Okay. Instructions are there. Okay, let's go to pathophysiology. So how does the acute humor increase or decrease drainage cause uh, IOP? So again, there are different types of glaucoma. Okay, let's specify a few. Uh, first, here are your risk factors. Who gets glaucoma? So here are the risk factors, people at risk. This is chart 58-6, page 19-11. <clears throat> so as I described, there are uh, different types of glaucoma, but all of them lead to 
increased IOP. So it's a combination of either increased aqueous humor production and or decreased aqueous humor drainage. So for our purpose, we'll only test the most common and one emergency, so narrow acute tangle glaucoma is the really emergency. Patient can go blind unless we take them to the hospital as soon as possible. <clears throat> Most common is the wide angle glaucoma. So manifestations, <clears throat> why is it called the silent thief of, an, of sight? So does the symptoms appear right away? No, for years, this patient will have absolutely no symptoms. So the only way we can diagnose glaucoma besides of course, once, once they already blind, uh, is annual checkup. So people like, uh, who wears glasses here all the time? So I see a few. So what does your eye doctor, your uh, optometrist do every year that you see them? They measure your IOP, correct? There are different ways to measure that. The one I hate is when they blow that uh, air into your eyeball. I hate that. But anyway, so they do this because it's necessary. We have to measure your IOP to diagnose glaucoma because are there symptoms? None. No symptoms, no pain, right? So we just need to really measure IOP. That's the only way to diagnose it. So we have to start young, right? Especially if people have refract. Uh, refraction disorders, which is, you know, you require reading glasses, for instance, so you need annual eye checkup. It just takes a few, you know, maybe an hour of wait, and then they, you get your IOP. Uh, when the patient does have symptoms, these are the reported manifestations, uh, but at this point, the patient already has lost some vision. The first vision loss is peripheral. Now, again, this these manifestations of vision loss is insidious. The patient will not notice this as it occurs. Okay? So once they notice it, oh, it's, it's too late. That vision is already gone. Right? You cannot recover that lost vision. So the objective at that point will just be to preserve what remaining peripheral vision the patient has okay? with, again, lifelong eye drop administration. Okay? That's all we can do at that point. So here are a few illustrations on how the angles are blocked. Okay? So whenever these canals are narrow, acute humor drainage uh, decreases or is blocked altogether, IOP increases, damage to the fragile nerves and blood vessels occur, and blindness ensues. Okay. So here are the most common, again, the, the ones we will test are only three. We have wide angle. These are your manifestations. Uh, we won't do the uh, normal tension. So we have wide angle, narrow angle, and then particularly acute angle closure. Because acute angle, um, angle closure, what is this again? It's an ocular administrative, uh, ocular emergency. So here, so on table 58-4, which ones will you study? Wide angle and the narrow angle and specifically acute, acute angle closure. So what am I testing whenever it's an emergency? Manifestations and interventions. Okay, so you need to know because are you there all the time? No, the patient will be at home somewhere at work. So you need to teach the patient the manifestation so that when it happens, they know when to call 911, right? So here are your manifestations. So it's only, uh, you know what? Let's just stick with two. Wide angle and acute angle closure glaucoma, right? So manifestations and interventions or nursing actions. Are we clear?
Okay, medications, there's a lot. So I only highlighted uh, the drugs that I'll, I'll actually be uh, using on the test question, but it's everything on this table. So cholinergics, that, that's what I'll use, pilocarpine, you know, the ones that you'll see in clinical, once you'll see actually uh, prescribed in New York City. So for cholinergics, it's pilocarpine. For beta blockers, timolol. For alpha adrenergic agonists, rimonidine. For carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, it's acetylsolamide. Prostaglandin analogs, latanoprost. And that's it. So that's one, two, five, right? One, yes. two, three, four, okay, five medication classes. So it's a drug chart. So what is always testable on the drug chart? Side effects and nursing interventions or client teaching. So these drugs <clears throat> do one of two things. So look at the second column under each, each medication. So action of pilocarpine, for instance, what does it do? Increase accuse uh, fluid outflow. Okay, so what does beta blockers do? Decrease aqueous humor production. What do, uh, what does rimonidine do? Decrease aqueous humor production. Remember, what, what did we say is the problem in uh, docoma? Increase production of aqueous humor and or decrease drainage or outflow. So your medications do exactly one or the other, right? So that's why. Again, will the patient be only on one? No, these patients will be on multiple. Most patients I know that have glaucoma are on three. They have three. Some have two, but most of them have multiple. I've never seen a glaucoma patient only have one eye drop. It's always two because is it good management if you only prescribe one? You know, just does one thing, like decrease acute humor? No, you have to pair it with increase drainage as well. Okay, so that's why they're always on two or more. Because is it good to preserve vision? Or do you just don't care and then just go blind? So the management of glaucoma is simply eye drop administration. For how long? Forever. It's important to explain that to the patient. And when you do your teaching, it's important to actually observe the patient. Have the patient return demonstrate the eye drop administration. It's not the patient, let's say it's the caregiver, yeah, the wife or the spouse. Watch them administer the eye drop. You'll be surprised that most of them, majority, don't know how to do it. Or if they do, they contaminate the bottle tip. Right? So it's important really to not assume, hey, okay? oh, they know they're grown as people. No, look at how they're, they're administering the medication. You'll be surprised how many don't know how to properly administer it. Same thing for inhalers. Okay, okay so surgical, surgical management, we're only focused on which part? Post-op care. Okay, let's go to the uh, post-op. So we had a chart, yeah, for the ear surgery. That was 59-7. Okay, there should be one also for after eye surgery. Somewhere here. All right, uh, it should be here. So, all right, all right I forgot. So, the surgical post op care is under cataracts. Okay, what are cataracts? This is lens opacity. Most people, majority, are elderly because this is usually a wear and tear uh, problem, meaning the lens over time become opaque. But we wonder, not all, not all old people develop. Cataracts. So there must be other causes. So we have risk factors listed here. So this doesn't occur overnight. Okay, this opacity here occurred over several years. Okay, so little by little, it didn't go to a full circle. Maybe it's, uh, started uh, at the bottom, for instance, or at the center. Okay, it's just a small patch, and then it grew and grew okay? until 
it now uh, covers the whole eyeball. So now, oh uh, no, sorry, sorry, the whole lens. So now the whole lens is opaque. Can you still see? No, it's like you have a dirty windshield, okay? So you put mud on your windshield, you can't get it off. That's what uh, the coma patients feel like. Something blocking the, the central vision. Symptoms, no pain, just painless, blurry vision. And then that gets worse over time. Okay, they can't see and then now here's the description. So their surroundings are dimmer, watching TV, they have to do it at a certain angle, right? And then of course you see the opacity of the lens. So sometimes depending on how it developed, they can have double vision. Of course, once diagnosed, the treatment is surgery. There's nothing else. No eye drops will cause this. Okay, so no non-surgical treatment exists, only surgery. Surgery will cure cataracts because now we'll remove that opaque lens. No, those lenses are no good. Now, whether or not the patient will have a new lens implant, the ophthalmologist will decide okay, whether the patient is a candidate for a lens implant or not. What's our responsibility again? Post-op care. So let's go to the post-op care. Uh, here are risk factors. So like I said, it's not just aging. So other people, young people can get it. Uh, metabolic disorders like uh, diabetes, for instance, can promote the, the growth of cataracts. Uh, infection or even trauma can also cause cataracts. So here are the other factors, the other toxic factors. I will cover table 58-6. Let me just go to the post health care. Uh, Pre-op, there's not much here. Let's go to the post-op care, right here, page 1970. <clears throat> now, we said, is, is the patient given any eye drops at all? Actually, they are, but these eye drops are not for the coma. These are for the post-op care, because after eye surgery, will, are they at risk for infection? Will there be any swelling there? Yes, so we will be giving them steroids, anti-inflammatory, and antibiotic eye drops. Are we clear? Okay. Is it for cataract though? No, this is for post-op care. How long will they be on the eye drops for life? Only for a few days, okay, after the surgery. Is that clear? So you still, do we still teach them how to administer eye drops? Yes, them or the caregiver, whoever is giving the eye drops. Okay, so it will still be included here. But here are your uh, important uh, postal care. So it's, there's no um, table or chart. So you have to pick it out of the entire paragraph. So first of all, you had surgery on this eye. So is it going to be nice and good after surgery? Okay, so watch on YouTube, watch videos on eye surgery. <clears throat> You'll see how traumatic it is. I can't show it to you because I can't bear to watch it uh, without crying. Okay, it just makes me tear. So watch it on your own, but it's very traumatic. Okay, so the number of instruments they'll use to move the eye around, or tie something here, lift this around here, and then use a scalpel to remove the, the, the cataract, okay? So it's, it's very traumatic. So of course, what will the eye look like after they did all that? It'll be red, yeah? Be swelling, will the eye be bloodshot? Yes, there's some bleeding there, right? So it'll be swollen, yeah? Okay, so will it be comfortable or will it be itchy and teary? And what will you do when your eye is itchy and teary? I'm gonna scratch it. You may stop yourself when you're awake, but you have to sleep at some point, yeah? So what will you do when you're sleeping? You're going to scratch it. So what will we put over this eye? An eye patch, okay? 
an eye patch is not like the you know, imagine eye patch like a pirate, right? No, it's it's a cover. All right, it's a cover. It will protect the eye. Okay, some people will wear a eye you know eye glasses, protection glasses, but uh, the surgeon will put a, a um, solid uh, plastic uh, eye cover over them. Okay, you can see, but you know it'll, it'll be protected, right? So that in your sleep you can't scratch it because there's a covering. Okay, so that's protection. Here, what are those intervention uh, activities again that we avoid? We Maybe mentioned it earlier with the ear. Okay, so anything that will cause you to hold, take in a deep breath and hold it, right? So that does that include uh, singing? Okay. Can I do that? I just had eye surgery. I went to watch um, Death Leopard. Can I sing along? Maybe lip sync, yeah? Yeah, but not really sing, okay? So here, eye shield, and then uh, avoid those activities. Okay, can they have sex? Okay, because that's a lot of holding your breath, okay? That increases intraocular pressure, intra-auditory pressure, and intracranial pressure. Can I be constipated? No. I should not be, because when I push that, it's the same thing, yeah? So remember, there are antibiotic eye drops, anti-inflammatory, and anti-steroid uh, yeah, eye drops, okay? So teach them how to administer them. Can they keep the eye, uh, can they wash, can they wash it? Shower? Okay, keep the operative eye dry. Okay, protective eye patch, All right. Now, the instruction here is first 24 hours, but are really, if you're the patient, shouldn't you really be not without this protective eye patch for at least a week? Are you okay? Can I scratch it tomorrow? How no, about well, the next day? No, because who knows what you do in your sleep, yeah? And you guys have very nice nails, yeah? <laughs> you gouge that eye out. All right. Um, <coughs> will there be crusting? We've, we've all had um, pink eye. So what always forms when you got pink eye? At the corner of your eye. Booger. Some drainage, right? Yeah, they said booger. So the eye booger. But here, will there be some crusting here? Yeah, right? But as long as the, the crust is like white, Okay, nothing like orange or red, brown, green, nothing colorful. It should be okay. Yeah. How about pain? Should there be pain? How much pain though? It should be severe. Okay, so yeah, there's eye discomfort. The doctor just messed with your eye. Your eye experienced uh, trauma from surgery. Yes, it's painful, but should not be severe. Okay. Any severe pain, is that reportable? Yeah, that's always a complication, right? Your vision is expected to improve, yeah? Okay, so here, slight morning discharge, some redness, a scratchy feeling may be expected. And what do you do with that? A damp, uh, a clean, damp washcloth, okay, to remove the uh, drainage. So here, extreme pain again, and these are, because this can cause, the surgery can cause retinal detachment. We'll talk about that later. So here are what you report. Um, signs and symptoms of detachment of the retina are the following. Bloaters, uh, flashing lights, decreased vision. Vision should improve, but probably not the, after the first few days, because the eye is still swollen. It will improve maybe a week later. All right, that's it for eye surgery. Okay, the next disorders, it's not a lot. We did glaucoma, cataract. Okay, retinal disorders now. Let's start with detachment, okay. So detachment, you know where your retina is? Okay. 
page was that? 1920. Okay. Your retina <clears throat> is that piece of tissue at the center <clears throat> but on the back of your eyeball. This is your retina, this layer of tissue right here. You see the yellow? So that is the retina. So it's just a thin membrane, rich in nerves, which allow you to see, okay? So what happens is light refracts as it enters your eyeball and it's reflected against your retina. So that allows you to interpret. Your brain, of course, will interpret what you're looking at, right? But the retina makes that vision possible, okay? So, Look at it. It's it's like a it's like skin, yeah, inner skin that can detach. That can be detached off of the eyeball. Okay, so what can detach that trauma? So there are different ways you can sustain trauma. One of them is, say you got mugged. Okay, somebody hits you on the head. So can boxers experience retinal detachment? Yeah, any other trauma, you get hit by baseball or just something stupid. Okay, you bent down under the desk, hurriedly got up, hit your head, hit blah. That can cause retinal right attachment, okay? So any trauma, including eye surgery. So that's why this was mentioned under cataract surgery. So patients, when it hears the manner, right? so there are different manners that this can detach. It can also detach in different parts of the eyeball. It could be up here, right in the center, or to the side, or underneath. So it can detach at any point of uh, your eyeball. Manifestations mentioned earlier under cataract surgery. So it'd be dead floaters in the eyes, bright flashing lights, and here, uh, there might not be pain uh, uh, all the time, especially, uh, except of course when you sustain the trauma, yeah, so there will be pain, but otherwise, no. So what are the manifestations again? Okay. Flashing lights. Uh, so it's important that people are educated about these. My father-in-law apparently sustained it, so he did not say anything. So he said he hit his head quite pretty hard uh, at some point, and he saw the floating, right? The floaters, we call them floaters, the bright flashing lights. He didn't say anything. So he just went on, and then two years later, he decided to go see an ophthalmologist because he couldn't see. And he thought it was from his diabetes. Then little did he know, he was actually retinal detached. He didn't say anything. So now he's blind in one eye. He still drives them. So watch out, you're living in Queens, he drives. So the management here is of course surgery, you have to surgically repair it. So there are different ways to do it. They'll put a buckle, wrap the uh, entire eyeball with a buckle, it to be attached. Um, post-op care, no different from cataract surgery. Okay, so cataract surgery, post-op care applies. However, there's a few things here under retractomy because this, this procedure uh, involves either a gas bubble or a silicone oil or perfluorocarbon liquids. And this is dense. So what they do when they inject it is uh, these gases are light, meaning they'll float up but they're dense, so therefore they will put pressure against the retina. <clears throat> so if the tear is, for instance, um, here, so what they'll do is inject the gas bubble here, and then what will, of course, the gas bubble do? Is it going to go down or up? It always goes up. So as it goes up, will it, will it push the retina back into place? Yes, that's what it'll do. So vitrectomy will do that. However, in order for it to work, the patient has to maintain a certain head position to keep the gas bubble there. 
right? So meaning most of the time, the doctor will tell them, of course, because the doctor put the gas bubble, he knows where he put it. So if he says, okay, you have to put your head on this position for the next few days. Okay, so the patient has to maintain this position or this position, whatever instruction the doctor said. Of course, they can, okay, they can put the head upright, but as, as much as possible, what should they do? Maintain that prescribed position. Are we clear? Because otherwise, it, will it work? No, because where will the gas bubble go if, you, if you're upright? It'll go somewhere, okay? It won't be pushing against the retina anymore. And what will happen to that gas bubble? It'll just be absorbed. It'll, it'll, the doctor doesn't have to aspirate it. Okay? It'll, it'll just be absorbed in the system, but it will reattach the retina, okay? So that's the one thing very important uh, teaching. Right, if they uh, undergo vitrectomy, right? All right, last topic is macular degeneration. There's two types here. We have a wet and a dry macular degeneration. Let's keep it simple. This is simply, if it's the dry type, which is the most common type, this is age-related. So most of your patients would be elderly. They have never seen a macular degeneration patient who's a baby. Right? Let's just put it that way. So all of them are later, okay, maybe in the late fifth, de fifth decade, but definitely in the sixth, sixth decade of life, right? So it's just wear and tear. Right, so your macula, what is the macula? This is the central part of your retina. This is responsible for central vision. So what type of blindness will occur here? Central vision loss. So, okay, so the patient will lose central vision. Unlike glaucoma, which is peripheral vision. So this one is central vision. So this occurs over time. Uh, there's nothing really we can do. I mean, your macula degenerated. So the only treatment here is vitamins, high vitamins, right? So we'll just give them Bausch & Lomb uh, Air Reds. Okay, Bausch & Lomb makes high, good high vitamins and that's what the doctor will prescribe. Okay, that's all we can do for macular degeneration. There's no surgery or anything we can do to correct it because the what happened to the macula again? Degenerated, okay, we call it macular degeneration. So age-related is dry. There's a wet type which can occur uh, in younger people. Now the problem in the wet type of macular degeneration is uh, this is caused by the growth of abnormal blood, blood vessels in the eye. Now these, eye, these blood vessels, it's kind of like a cancer, cancerous process but it's not cancer, but similar. The eye somehow started growing leaky, abnormal blood vessels. So these blood vessels are of course not normal, so they're weak, they're leaky, and then they cause <coughs> um, increased pressure in the eye. Okay, and of course what will happen to the blood flow to the, uh, to the retina, to the macula, if these blood vessels are abnormal, will they supply? the macula with the adequate oxygen? No, okay, because these blood vessels again are leaky. <laughs> so if it's um, this type, then there's a cure, okay? There's a cure for that. So the since these abnormal blood vessels leak blood, so there are two uh, treatments here. So they can do laser surgery, stop the blood vessels from leaking, or they can give them medications um, like uh, endothelial, um, right here, endothelial growth factor, right here. We can give uh, vascular endothelial growth factor injections. Okay, so these are the known treatment. These two, they they sound like chemo drugs, yeah, because they are. These are chemo drugs because. Uh, what what uh, these drugs do in cancer is, of course, uh, cancers will <clears throat> will um, 
produce endothelial growth factor, meaning what is that? That's a enzyme that will command the body to grow new blood vessels to feed the tumor. Okay, so therefore, if we give the drug that stops that, will you treat the cancer? Yes, this drug will work for the wet type of macular degeneration. That's it.